So, um, yeah, it was a great pleasure to be here, and I'm very embarrassed I haven't been here before. It's very exciting. I'm just, the questions have been fantastic, so now I'm totally terrified because I've never given this talk in 15 minutes. <laughs> but, um, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's going to seem uh, perhaps um, simple-minded, but my take-home message is simple-minded. It's that the brain is a castle built on an outhouse, and the outhouse is your nose. And it's, it's a, your outhouse is the olfactory system, and we can't understand brain, mind, thought, memory, and we can't solve any of the problems that Jim has thrown out for us to solve unless we understand how we think, and how we think is um, through our nose. So what I, what I mean by that, I mean this is actually, a, um, I'm uh, somebody who's I'm an animal behaviorist who has, um, is interested in the evolution of cognition and really kind of stumbled on something about olfaction a couple of years ago. And so I am new to olfaction, um, but I've, um, I've, I've already um, you know, made some headway with, with this new idea. So, so this, is the, this is the idea. Um, that to understand, uh, again, as an evolutionary biologist, if you have a really complex system, the way to solve it is uh, you have to have a historical approach. You can't understand any of Jim's systems without understanding the history of that. Just like, and you can't understand a brain, which is, was not designed by an engineer. It was, it evolved, jerry-rigged, um, you know, moving through um, optimal um, minima all the way till it got to where it is today. And it turns out where it came from is hugely um, influenced by um, olfaction. And in fact, um, what do we know about the first brain? I think this is a really interesting question that um, what, this is what I'm trying to tackle, is can we use what we know about uh, brains that live now to go back in time, triangulate to the first brain and ask why did that first brain evolve? Um, and, and I would submit that we, that would give us information um, about how the brain is organized and how it processes information and, and it, it, it will um, give us organizing principles for our own brains, which um, in fact for all brains, in fact that's what I'm gonna argue, that all these brains actually even the honeybee uh, is its brain, and so, some people are arguing, is actually homologous to our brain. It's the same brain. It's, we've inherited it through, from a common ancestor. Okay, so that's an uh, outrageous claim. But what do we know about the brain? And well, the first thing we know is it evolved underwater because life evolved underwater. And in fact, um, it was, it's a very, um, all the phyla that are present first evolved underwater. It, in, in this underwater world, is defined by chemicals. And um, the, the first animals were single-celled um, animals that move in response to chemicals, that using um, uh, chemotaxis, all the first sensory system of, of any active animal, um, either a prokaryote, a single cell bacteria, or, or a multi celled animal, um, the first animals were only living in a chemical world where they're responding to chemicals. But it is, it is now um, the use of chemicals, olfaction, um, to, for, for cognition, is universal. It's used in all animals. So it's not only the first, it's also the most universal, it's the only universal um, sense. And um, across the animal kingdom, where it's been measured, and that includes Drosophila and uh, nematodes and, um, and mammals, the largest part of the largest um, gene family in, in, the, in the genetic code is devoted to olfaction. It's devoted to olfactory um, receptors, um, coding or olfactory receptors. And it's not just true of primitive animals, it's of worms and, um, and flies, it's true of, of birds, it's true of humans. So, um, so that we're investing a huge amount into this system. So you've got this, it's the first system, it's ancient, it's universal, and it's still to this day um, under um, 
dynamic selective pressure and, and, and it's being maintained at this very high cost to, um, to the system. It's also, in the world where it evolved, in the marine world, it is um, until the evolution of um, things like sonar, which was very late in, in evolutionary history, when we're talking about the first um, couple of hundred million years, olfaction is the only sense you can use to re to re for remote sensing. Uh, even even today, I, I even though I'm this is being sponsored by Minerva, um, <laughs> uh, vision is not as good as olfaction. And in fact, olfaction is a in, is an incredibly um, powerful sense because you can detect um, a few molecules from a source and that and, and you can detect that gradient. And um, and what I'm going to argue today is there you can do more than just simply um, move up and down plumes, but you can actually map your map, map where you are in space. And um, and and to get back again to Jim's talk, um, I others have argued, uh, computational neuroscientists have argued that Olfaction was the first problem the brain solved, and it was the hardest problem. And once you've solved how to map the world based on turbulent gradients and, and the unpredictability of the olfactory world, you can do anything. And then vision, olfact, anything else was, was a piece of cake. And, and, and it, you know, it's what they're arguing is that really you do have to understand how the brain evolved in this world doing doing this. So, okay, so what do we know about the evolutionary history of the brain? Well, that's a problem because it all happened at once. There was an evolutionary big bang in which this was the Cambrian explosion. And, and in the explosion, within 80 million years, suddenly um, we went from a world that just had little wormy things that lived um, in the algal map um, near the ocean shore and um, did a little bit of burrowing into under you know into the surface but basically they were all herbivores and it was this peaceable the peaceable kingdom basically and then something happened and within um, 70 to 80 million years suddenly all the phyla um, with one exception all animal phyla appeared um, and 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 so by um, 50 580 million years ago, all the animal phyla, basically the ancestors were there, and then we've just all differentiated since then. So it really was a big bang. And the um, and what's remarkable, um, what particularly interesting about that, the Cambrian explosion, is that um, um, what you what you saw was this um, this cultural shift from these peaceable herbivores to this bloodthirsty Cambrian, the bloodbath of the Cambrian, where suddenly you've got all these weird animals, many of which have gone extinct, these um, animals with you know, five eyes and a, and a little um, you know, uh, pincher out in front. These, these are not um, phyla that all, uh, all exist anymore, but they were all predators, and they were all eating other animals, and their shells, they every, what happened dramatically is, um, it was the appearance of weapons and armor. And so by the end of the Cambrian explosion, everyone was armored. It was because everyone was eating everyone. And of course, by eating um, animals, you, could, you, you had a much higher uh, quality diet. And then that probably, that, that turned into this arms race where suddenly, once you could start eating someone else, then your um, calories go up and you start getting, you can get bigger and then, then you, but to get bigger then you have, you know, there's all this, this rapid thing. But the, the fact is the fossil record went from nothing um, to little wormy things to everything in, 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 in such a short time that we have no resolution. Um, so we, we can speculate. Well, that's what, that's what we do, we speculate. And one thing is clear is by the end of this revolution, that all these um, heavily armored predators had compound eyes, they had antenna, they had, um, they clearly were using olfaction and vision. And we knew they had olfaction before because everyone had olfaction. There were no eyes, um, fossil eyes, before this period. By the end of this period, you had this beautiful integration of olfaction and vision. Um, and so, 
you like I said, you, this is an example of what you started with and what you, what, and what you um, ended with. You ended up with this, this predator. Well, what we know, for example, about the evolution of brains is where you see um, brains getting bigger across evolutionary time is when animals become more mobile. And, and usually what that means, and, and they, um, they become more mobile and they become more efficient predators. So for example, vertebrates started as um, animals with fixed um, open mouths with no hinge jaws. And the, the, jaw, the jawless fishes were very successful until the first jawed fish appeared and then suddenly the jawless fishes disappeared and we only have lampreys and hagfish left. Um, and it was, at the same time, um, we went from jawed, um, jawless to jawed fish and a huge increase in brain size. And um, the appearance of the, um, the notochord, um, in, uh, which is a stiffened, a stiffened rod in the backbone, it was before the vertebrae, but it was in the pre-vertebrae, which allowed um, animals to attach muscles and move more efficiently. Again, that led to another increase in complexity, increase in brain. So, um, so it seems that, that increasing your predatory abilities obviously has a huge um, beneficial effect on your, your behavioral complexity and, um, and, and brain size. So we know that um, these animals um, were probably, they were predators, they were navigating, they were using at least olfaction and vision. So what caused this revolution? Um, this, uh, this is, um, we, a student in my lab um, came up with that logo for us. Um, what we're interested in is the um, understanding the um, evolution of life and um, understanding how cognition affects the evolution of life. And one, and so what were um, what happened in this Cambrian revolution is that suddenly there was no nervous system. Now you've got a nervous system. Well, what do you get with a brain? You get something you um, as opposed to a bacteria that just sees an, a, um, a stimulus and reacts. Now um, you can move beyond reaction. You can actually. Uh, learn. Now, well, what's the advantage of learning? Associative learning is found in animals, even without brains, animals with nerve nets, but the ability to learn means that you can predict, and if you can predict, you can control. And, I mean, these are, um, uh, these are obvious things, but what I'm proposing is that um, other uh, people have suggested the Cambrian explosion was caused by the evolution of learning. Well, I think we have to be more specific. I think it was caused by the evolution of the ability to map and navigate um, specifically in response to, to odors. And I'm not, I've got a, a more detail that I'm not putting into this talk, but there's a reason um, why, um, which maybe we can get at in the questions. But let me just give you the, the overview. Uh, you might not know that animals map and, the, and this ability to map was first actually discovered at Berkeley by um, Edward Tolman, who was a great man, um, the, the, um, and who studied rats in mazes, and in 1949 published the paper, um, The Cognitive, Cognitive Maps in Rats and Men. And he, was, he fought bitterly with the behaviorists like B.F. Skinner his whole career, who believed that animals were stimulus response machines. But he thought, um, he kind of, he had this outpost in Berkeley saying animals have representations and um, Tolman has been vindicated and his paper is, is actually continually cited even today because it's realized that, uh, that non-humans actually have um, very good mapping systems and could make um, their, they actually, human and non-human cognition is not very different, um, is not so different after all. At the same um, time as Tolman was working at Berkeley, Gustav Kramer in Germany was studying um, the carrier pigeon, the homing pigeon, and showing that um, homing pigeons also, their, um, mat, their, their um, behavior, when they're released from a place they've never been, the only way you could explain that behavior is somehow they had a map of their environment. It, would, it could not be explained by any kind of stimulus response thing. So by the end of the 40s, uh, we, we had these two men who never, who never communicated, both suggesting that animals you know, are making maps. And so we've got a mammal and we've got a bird, and, and I would say that since both of them since um, published this work in the 40s, both died in the 50s, 
um, both have been vindicated that um, there's now um, decades of research showing that both rats and pigeons are making maps and making them in similar ways, which is um, rats in the lab and pigeons in the field. Um, what's, um, so really we've got, uh, even though we've got very, the, the brains, sep birds and mammals separated 300 million years ago, we've got very similar um, cognitive abilities here. And recently, um, that circle has been closed by a beautiful study uh, in the um, Egyptian fruit bat in Israel, where finally we're taking flying mammals and testing the same theories in flying mammals by taking these, mam these bats out to the desert where they've never been, just like a, hum like a homing pigeon, and releasing it. Now, of course, with the advantage of GPS um, loggers and showing that fruit bats navigate exactly the way you expect birds. They, this is, you put them into a crater so that they have no, there are no visual cues, and they circle around, and they take um, sightings, and then they, they decide, and then they take off, and then they beeline back to their, um, their roost, and they've never been in this area uh, before. Um, this is a baby fruit bat, and um, uh, I put that up there because um, a, a new interest of mine is, the, um, which is actually quite interesting, is the effect of cute animals on cognitive processing, which is becoming <laughs> a really interesting field, the science of cute. I'm teaching a freshman seminar on this, and it turns out that you looking at that, if you think that's cute, which I think of bat is incredibly cute, but it, it, it actually, um, it changes, it activates your nucleus accumbens, it changes your uh, focus, your attention, it makes you happier, it makes you slower and more careful when it, if you're doing something on a completely abstract task, and you can get the same effect if I show you a car that's been morphed to have big eyes and a round face, so just like a baby, so it's really interesting uh, behavior. Okay, that, that, that I sometimes I throw these up in my slides. Uh, in my uh, talk, in my, when my lectures for my students get really boring, I throw them a lot of cute animals. So. Okay, so, and, but pigeons, um, what was remarkable is that Floriano Poppy um, showed in the 1970, and again, uh, I keep using this word vindicated, but he fought for years um, against um, the other pigeon camps, and, and he, it's, it was, um, he, he's, uh, it's now the best um, studied system, the best studied sensory system in pigeons, and it turns out that pigeons absolutely need their noses to navigate. And and if you um, block, um, so here's here's the here's the loft, and you release pigeons from these four areas, and you just release them, and they all um, beeline back to the loft. And th these are the pigeons who have had their nostrils blocked, or they've um, you know various olfactory manipulations and. So this is really very strange. This bird has to have, it has to have experience in the first three months of life living in a loft where its cage is open to the air and, and um, so it can associate odors and wind. And if you block that or if um, you can, you can um, raise them in lofts where, with wind deflectors and then they learn the wrong um, directions and, and, you can, and, and that will later affect their, life, their lifelong navigation abilities. So it's, they're really sensitive, but once they learn their olfactory map, that's what they use the rest of their life. And, and this is a, an animal that is incredibly visual, but it's using olfaction and in fact, there's no other sense that can substitute for olfaction because if you knock out the nostril, they are they're lost. It's it's a very it's a very very interesting um, thing to see in such a a long um, such a visual animal. And in fact, carrier um, homing pigeons are bred for racing, and the the racing breeds, the racing um, strains, actually have a larger olfactory system than the non-racing strains. So, but they also have um, a particular brain structure which um, they have in common with mammals, which is the hippocampus. And um, so here's a rat brain. This is a non-distorted um, drawing of the, the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb. So you kind of notice those are two large, large areas. Um, that's, the hippocampus is actually made of two pieces, an old piece and a new piece. The old piece is something that's homologous with lizards the new piece is something that's only found in mammals and birds. Um, and here's um, your hippocampus. Again, it's 
we've got all this you know, garbagey filing cabinets on top, but basically, to me, the important thing, this is the important part of the brain. This is where, this is where it all started. Um, and in fact, the size of the hippocampus can be predicted by how much an animal uses space, maps space, and that's true of rats, pigeons, monkeys, humans, bats, fish, lizards, um, basically everything but amphibians, because no one's actually done the, the work in amphibians. Um, and the, the size of the hippocampus, so the size of the hippocampus, um, and, the, and there's only been this one study in the homing pigeons, but the size of the hippocampus and the size of the olfactory bulb actually, um, it both are increased in birds that are specialized navigators. And so what, I, I, um, what I've suggested is that we have to rethink the olfactory system. We have to start thinking about it as part of a navigational system. And since I published that idea, uh, primatologists um, has now published a new analysis of primate olfactory bulb and hippocampus and showing, just like in the homing pigeon, the olfactory bulb and hippocampus are predicted by home range size in solitary primates. So it's, um, and, but, and, and you may have seen this on the news, um, your um, olfactory system has now been uh, estimated that we, you can encode um, one trillion stimuli. Talk about big data. It's, it's, uh, um, the olfactory system is not only primordial, it's, um, you're not aware of it, it's generally unconscious because it's going in, not, it's not going into your thalamus, it's going in directly to its own private Idaho, um, the, you know, the, um, the, the, the olfactory cortex, and the, um, the emotional centers, the amygdala and hippocampus, before it ever even sees the, um, the rest of the brain. Um, it's, more, it's more emotional. There is no such thing as an, a olfactory memory that's not encoded deeply and uh, emotionally. It's, it's tabula rasa. There's no, um, odors don't have innate meanings. Everything is learned, which is why babies think anything is, smells good. Um, and it's, it's very high, it's, it's high capacity, uh, one trillion. And, and again, I think if, if you want to study and understand big data, this is where, this is the place to start. Um, even so that's a great story. What I'm telling you is we've got this beautiful vertebrate system, and it maps, and, it, and, and it's a hippocampus, and the olfaction, and the olfactory system, and they're both old systems in the brain, and they're connected by two synapses. I mean, end of story, except that um, we've got mapping in other animals, and we've got mapping in honeybees now. Randolph Menzel's work, uh, hat, um, m mapping to specifically simulated magnetic fields in uh, in lobsters, and so we've got these invertebrates that are mapping just the way vertebrates are, and they don't have a hippocampus. So, what does that say, and what can we do? Well, what we need is to look for the neural common denominator of all these animals. And we've got a behavior, so what's the neural common denominator? It's a very crude approach. And could this be you know, the ancestral Cambrian solution? And the, the common denominator is going to be is obviously the olfactory system. And, but the olfactory system is um, incredibly, um, bizarrely similar across animals. This is your nose and here's your olfactory bulb, and it's organized into little uh, balls of neuropil, which are called glomeruli. And glomeruli are found in all animals, except so far in C. elegans, but everything else, um, mollusks, insects, vertebrates, um, so invertebrates and vertebrates. And it's not just that you've got glomeruli, but if you look at the um, actual circuitry of um, olfactory systems from the as odors come in, receptors, first stage, second stage, the, um, the, the topology of the, the circuitry and um, the dynamics and the oscillations and how odors are coded using the same kinds of oscillations, that's been shown to be um, exactly the same in insects and in, in vertebrates. Exact, not exactly the same, but very, very similar to, I mean, this has been pointed out for decades and you've got lots of computational neuroscientists working on olfaction in locusts and honeybees because of this, because it's um, it's so um, similar to the to to the mammal. Um, so what I would argue is that this is the the legacy of this fir the first brain and 
its reliance on olfactory navigation, that this is the outhouse that the castle of the cerebrum is built on, um, based on these convergent lines of evidence that, such as the olfactory bulb is larger in species that use more space. This has been shown in birds, mammals, and now um, actually recently in dinosaurs. Um, hippocampus size increases um, with space use. So the, these, these are, again, this is like a navigational system. And the other really um, interesting thing is the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus are the only two areas in your brain and any um, that you have in common with all other vertebrates, including all fish, all reptiles, amphibians, everybody, that those are the only two areas in your brain where you're con continually producing new neurons. And th that new neurons are being, um, are, you're responding to exploring new space, exploring new odors that stimulates the new um, neurons being born in the nose and in the hippocampus. And other vertebrates have lots of, um, they have other areas where you also have neurogenesis, but the only, there's only those two areas are the only ones that are in common across all vertebrates. And those are also, um, you also find that in the honeybee. Um, in, in um, well, um, in their nervous system, because it turns out that um, recent work has shown beautiful work has looked at um, the gene networks that underlie the development of the forebrain in the marine annelid worm, which is the best model for the, the our kind of common ancestor insects. It turns out are not a good model because they in, they evolve too quickly but this is a um, this is the, the marine annelid worm is a nice conservative model and if you look at the mouse and the marine annelid worm what you see is they have a, um, a, a homologous sequence of um, of genes uh, that that actually lead to um, underlie the development of the brain so not just me people like Corey Bargman who's now head of the new brain initiative um, also says this is evidence that there was one brain there was one brain, it happened, and then everything has split off since then. And so I would, I would suggest, and she would, I mean, and Corey also, that that is um, what happened at the Cambrian explosion, that there was, um, the brain was invented, and that led to this um, incredible um, change and in, um, in, in increase in, in complexity based, based on this, this um, gene network that then um, went off in different developmental directions um, in um, protostomes and deuterostomes, the, the vertebrates and invertebrates. So what that means for our brain is I think we really have to think differently about the limbic system, um, which is um, considered this low level emotional, you know, kind of um, uh, non-cognitive area. Um, so there's the limbic system, the um, olfactory bulbs, the hippocampus, um, and the amygdala, and the hypothalamus, that's a rat, and that's, that's human. And actually, uh, it turns out that um, the amygdala, the, um, there are two parts of the amygdala, the olfactory amygdala actually also has low-level uh, neurogenesis. So you've got these three areas, again, are the only, the only areas where you have any kind of neurogenesis. And, um, and you've got a similar um, areas, the antennal lobe and projecting to the mushroom body uh, has the same relationships as the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus. And so what I propose is that this is um, the original function of this system was this olfactory navigational system where it is encoding what, where, and why. And the what meaning the odors, but but the idea is that you didn't. These are um, uh, you. You don't really know what something is unless you know where it is, and so these are um, intimately connected. And then the why is encoding the um, value of the um, of of the stimulus. Um, so that the first brain was making these crude maps where it was saying that here are some odorants, and this one is associated with something positive, this is associated with something negative, and so it's the, all, that's all you really, all, that's all the brain really needs to do, and the what, where, why, and then you can start making it more and more sophisticated and, um, and moving, um, uh, moving on um, to more and more interesting, you know, with increased memory. And, and so if that's true, then there, these are, there should be fingerprints of this system all the way through our cognition. And that's what, um, um, you know, that this system should have, 
if it was the first operating system, the first, the olfactory navigational system, then there should be um, ways that that can help us understand human cognition. And that's exactly, um, I, think, I think you can make that argument. Um, a, um, Marcel Proust's Madeleine, what was, um, you know, is an olfactory memory. And what's um, interesting about Proustian memories, which are now being studied in, um, in great detail, there's a whole new field of olfactory cognition, is that um, it's, they, they are more um, emotional. I mean, the olfactory memories, if, you, if I tell you, um, recall um, the memory of, if I, wait, let me not go into experimental details. Um, there, um, the reason you remember um, um, more clearly in response to olfactory cue is because olfactory things that are encoded with, a, with an olfactory cue are encoded with more emotion and there's just more m emotional activation and so that seems like that's fine but that's very primitive but what's interesting is that they're also they, 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 um, they trigger clearer um, episodic memories which an episodic memory is by definition you, um, only found in humans and it's a spatial temporal memory. It's a memory of um, right now, you've never seen me give this talk before in this slide, so you might have a visual image and if you right now um, were smelling something unique and tomorrow someone gave you that smell or 10 sure. years from now, you would, um, you would, um, you would smell it, okay. And so, so I would um, argue that here the most human of all memories, which is episodic memory, which is autobiographical memory, is actually has this deep olfactory foundation, and so that um, that th and that's just the the uh, the tip of the iceberg. And we really need to think about ol human cognition in terms of olfaction. And um, and I also study squirrels, um, and uh, we do study squirrels. And I'd like to thank my funders and my graduate students and, and postdocs um, for their help in helping me uh, with these ideas. Thanks.